Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I am Eve Engler, the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. This Canadian Foreign Policy Hour is a weekly critical look at Canada's role abroad. Uh, it's been going on for about, uh, about two years now. I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, uh, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. And uh, a decent number of developments uh, in Canadian foreign policy this week. Uh, 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 beginning, there's this story about how the Canadian government rejected the Taliban's uh, push to uh, take over the Afghan um, embassy in uh, Ottawa, and uh, Canada is continuing with this position of not recognizing the Taliban uh, government, which um, uh, <clears throat> I think most countries are following. It seems, I don't know, I mean, I, I think there's lots, obviously lots not to like about the Taliban. Uh, I'm not sure how long this is a, a good exercise. Of, of refusing to recognize the Taliban though. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, that's the Canadian uh, position. Uh, there's a story that Canadian Dimension published titled AMLO's Push for Environmental Reforms Angers Canadian Mining Sector. And there's a big push from the uh, social democratic uh, president of uh, Mexico to uh, strengthen legislation on mining companies and the Canadian government, Canadian mining companies particularly, have been uh, uh, hostile uh, to that. And uh, uh, there's some updates of information that we kind of knew a little bit about what Canada has been doing in Canadian mining companies which dominate in Mexico and their push against uh, the uh, reformist uh, uh, moves uh, by uh, that country's uh, president, who's who's almost uh, he's almost done his mandate. Um, so uh, the story speculates on whether the um, if his if it, if his successor uh, from the Morena party wins, then they'll probably continue with these reforms that are being uh, planned. Uh, but whether if he, if they don't win, if she doesn't win, it's a woman. I'm forgetting her name right now. Uh, uh, then um, then they might be uh, scuttled. Right this weekend uh, and uh, the next couple of days is the uh, Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada conference in Toronto, which is the biggest mining gathering in the world. Tomorrow, there is a protest happening at five o'clock uh, downtown, uh, I think close to the convention center in Toronto, where the conference is taking place. Uh, so if anyone's in Toronto, you might want to check out that um, that protest. The international there's a story about the International Criminal Court moving forward with its uh, probe into alleged crimes against humanity in Venezuela by the Venezuelan government. Uh, this is something that Canada pushed back in 2018, I believe, as part of the destabilization against uh, Maduro. And the ICC seems to be, uh, move, uh, they, their initial investigation is allow, allowing this to move forward. Now, of course, the ICC has refused to investigate Israeli officials. Anyone who believes that uh, Venezuelan officials are responsible for more human rights violations than uh, Israeli officials um, has a serious, serious uh, uh, issue on their hand with their ability to uh, to just uh, see what's plainly in front of their face. Uh, nonetheless, this is the international order uh, and the ICC is a reflection of that international order. So the Canada pushes to bring Venezuelan government to the ICC, but they threaten ICC funding if they investigate um, Israel. Anyways, that's proceeding. Uh, uh, Venezuela is going to be, or Venezuela official, I think Maduro, I'm not sure what officials exactly are going to be pursued. Uh, the Venezuelan foreign minister criticized Canadian officials. So a Canadian, I think it was the high commissioner in uh, in Guyana, went to the uh, 
uh, western part of Guyana, the disputed area, the Essequibo es region. And he, he met with a Canadian uh, company operating there. And the Venezuelan government responded, uh, criticized this because this is disputed. And it's a big dispute. And my inclination is broadly to be a, sympathetic to the Guyanese position here not necessarily the Venezuelan position, but um, I'm certainly not sympathetic towards the, you know, Canadian, US, Exxon primarily, but a whole bunch of Canadian companies, oil companies that are the ones really uh, driving this, uh, you know, the extraction and that leading to the rekindling of tensions between uh, uh, Venezuela and, and Guyana. So the, the Venezuelan ambassador or Venezuelan uh, foreign minister said, Canada, a constant aggressor against Venezuela, always seeking to provoke and harm our homeland, is now illegally getting involved in a territorial controversy that does not concern them, taking sides and violating all established principles between Guyana and Venezuela. Canada has no say in matters concerning the es Esequibo region. The Guyanese government must immediately demand the withdrawal of Canada's statement and CELAC must take note, CELAC being the community of Latin American and Caribbean countries, must take note of this reckless and ill-intentioned Ill declaration that undermines peace and stability in our region. Um, so Venezuela is, is pushing back against Canada's uh, role, the Canadian company's role uh, in this uh, disputed uh, area. The, I mentioned that the Journal de Montréal published, I think it was two, uh, I might have mentioned it two weeks in a row, they they made a big thing about this uh, Chinese uh, camera uh, company being participating in this participating in this big security forum that took place in Quebec City, I believe, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And they're basically how you know how could this Chinese company participate? It's it's a threat. The Americans have said their cameras could be sending the information about you know my kid Joshua going to school at the Montreal school. It's going directly into the Chinese Communist Party uh, uh, brain trust, and they're finding out what what my son is doing in grade one, and therefore are 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 we're under real threat. Um, so this is the kind of uh, this is the kind of idea that this uh, this Chinese company is some big threat. Uh, it makes no sense to me. Maybe at you know as I mentioned last time, maybe at the high level of like you know you know maybe you wouldn't want to have them at CSIS on the grounds. There's a very 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 small chance that they could be providing. Uh, you know, intelligence to the to the Chinese government, but that's very unlikely. And I don't think it matters at most the vast majority of public institutions in the country. Nonetheless, so Journal de Montréal made a kerfuffle about the Chinese company and they, they got what they wanted and they had to publish a story saying that the Chinese company is now banned from this, this security forum that includes a whole bunch of the major Canadian security companies um, like Garda World. Uh, and this is just one further step in this whole process of delinking with with China. The China's a threat. The Americans, I think on Thursday or Friday, they released a thing saying that the probe into the security risk of Chinese connected cars. So they're basically saying that like what what we're seeing is a, a greater worry beginning in Europe around the Chinese cars are basic Chinese are basically able to export cars far cheaper, particularly electric cars, than, than the major North American, Japanese, uh, Western European uh, companies. And so now they're saying this is, the Americans are setting the stage for this, saying this is a security threat. And if you buy a Chinese car, you know, you're going to be, they're going to find out when you went to McDonald's and it's going to be sent right to the Chinese Co Communist Party's brain trust. And they're going to, you know, have that uh, intel on you. That's, that's the storyline. And, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, but basically it's going to be all about really about, but, but co competition and, and, uh, you know, using the security argument to protect the, the, uh, auto sector of, uh, North America and, uh, uh Western European J and Japan. Um, so that's a big step, I think, forward in that whole, uh, the whole economic kind of war with China. If they do move that path to really ban Chinese, uh, car imports, um, and, and, this, I think there's a deep, pretty good chance that's gonna, that's gonna actually, we're gonna see that play out over the next couple of years here. The uh, Legion paper, uh, the, I think it's called the Legion, 
Yeah, um, they published a story called The Canadian Press Distributes Wartime News for Troops Overseas. And it's all about this uh, Canadian press uh, bulletin during World War II that became like the bulletin for Canadian soldiers in, uh, in Western Europe. And, and they talk a little bit about, um, I think it's that Ross Monroe, who was this, the most prominent uh, World War II, Canadian World War II uh, uh, correspondent. And um, he, he's working for Canadian Press and then sort of just goes through some of the history of his, how important this became for the troops. Now, what's interesting about this is that the, in my book, Propaganda System, I talk about this a little bit, that the Canadian Press begins as a government-financed uh, war propaganda uh, uh, outlet. So during World War I, particularly in the west of the country, Associated Press, the American um, news agency, was a, the main wire service. And but the, but the U.S. wasn't at war early on in the war, right? And so it wasn't viewed as sufficiently sort of pro-war. So basically, the federal government spent uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars at the time, where I think in you know millions of dollars in today's money, to get Reuters, uh, wire service, which of course the British wire service, which was you know more rah rah, um, into uh, all across the country. And so that's sort of the beginning of the Canadian press is as a wartime. Um, uh, Prop, war propaganda uh, uh, news agency. And then during World War II, it, it becomes the dominant news agency in large part because of its, this the story is talking about and other elements of it being really close to the K military on the ground uh, uh, fighting. And I tell a story about, it might've been Ross Monroe, I forget who it was, but but one of the the um, the big correspondents for uh, uh, Canadian press during World War II be it goes from working as the as, at 4K Press uh, to working in, or maybe it's the other way, the other way around, working uh, uh, with a unit, the, the like the PR public relations officer for the unit, and then the next day he's working for Canadian Press, and he's with the same unit. He's just like so. One time you have literally the military hat, and then like the next day you have the the media hat, um, just to give a sense of how connected it was to the sort of military um, at the time. And, and, you know, it still is, of course, the most important um, news agency in the country. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's still, of course, very tied to maybe not quite as extreme as during World War I and World War II, but still very tied to the military, the foreign policy establishment, uh, uh, et cetera. The New York Times had a piece uh, that mentions that the, the Australians are kind of working with the Pentagon because uh, they want to use sort of like the industrial capacity in, in Australia to provide weapons because in the context of all the use of weapons in Ukraine, not able to produce enough munitions and whatnot. And, and in this story, it, said, it points out that the Australians are looking for um, an exemption to military export laws. And the story points out that the only country that has that is Canada. And what they're referring to is the defense production sh sharing arrangement, which goes back to the mid 1950s, which basically means that Canadian arms are, the Canadian, it's all totally integrated. There's no, uh, no uh, tariffs, no, we don't even know Canadian weapons. We don't even uh, uh, compile the data on the exports to the US uh, from Canadian arms companies because it's just they're so integrated and of course it's what's led to is all these you know American companies that are dominant that are they are made major arms uh, manufacturers in Canada um, anyways it's so that the defense production sharing arrangement is it's a it's really important uh, part of of actually Canadian foreign policy because the reason why the Americans pushed it it was actually Americans that were really pushing it back in the 50s so it's like this really good deal for Canadian companies in the in the fifties because they got basically to be to contract with the Pentagon, which is far and away the biggest uh, purchaser of of arms. Uh, they got this special deal, but the why the American government was willing to do it is because they saw this as a way of turning the Canadian business class broadly, but more specifically the arms sector 
into advocates of, of US militarism, US foreign policy, you know, broadly, right? Um, so they got them to tie their interests directly into the interests of the Pentagon and, uh, and that, that that would have a, a broader impact on uh, Canadian foreign policy. There's a story about the, the um, a new assessment from the uh, uh, PBO's office, uh, uh, parliamentary budget officer, uh, saying that the 20 year plan, uh, a big uh, arms purchase plan that is now gone up by 50 billion from the previous estimate. So now it's 214 billion point eight and the previous is 164 billion. So this is just one more instance. I don't know what this includes. I think this includes some of the fighter jets and, and, the, and the naval vessels, I believe. But the basic point is when you start looking at the sums that are being allocated to arms purchases, it's just unbelievable, right? These are just incredible sums of money and they're going up. I saw stories saying that it's like 17% inflation in the, in the arms sector right now. Uh, so the, 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 the uh, prices of anything are going up. And this is, you know, this is, it's, it's madness. It really is truly madness amidst the, the climate crisis and, you know, far, far bigger security threats. But this is where it's going. And the push to increase military spending is not subsiding. In fact, it's, it's, uh, it's ramping up. Um, so I'm sure people saw that uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, the French president, he talked about uh, sending troops to Ukraine. Um, There's a big NATO conference in Paris, and he raised this, floated the idea, which a bunch of countries responded to negatively. Um, it, 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 it seems to me what it's going, what's going on here is kind of an interesting dynamic where they're realizing it's increasingly obvious that, that the projections that the, you know, they were kind of boosting about Ukrainian success, that's not happening. You're, so you're seeing now a greater admission of that on one hand, but then simultaneously you're saying, you're seeing more and more saying like, we can't, we have to double down. We have to, you know, we can't let this happen. So it's kind of a scary moment where it's like we're good, we're losing. It's gonna they're gonna they're not they're gonna fail, and it's like either we we you know ramp it all up and push the whole prospect of nuclear war pushed in that way, or we basically concede that Ukraine should should uh, uh, negotiate uh, some way out. And and at this point, there's no good option for Ukraine. They're not getting. I don't think they're getting basically any of the territory they've lost back. Now it's a question of that if they, if Ukraine could come to an agreement with the current lines of control, that to me is the best case, well, not the best case, but towards the best case of likely of what they're going to get at the end of this. I think the more likely scenarios end up losing more of their territory. Um, all a very horrible uh, affair. Now, amidst this, Bill Blair, uh, Canada's defense minister, he he said he he said that like no, we're not going to send troops. But then, um, from what I can tell, he seemed to be closer to the uh, Macron position than most of the other NATO countries. Uh, and he said he said Canada's open in a Toronto Star interview. Canada's open to sending a limited number of military personnel to train Ukrainian troops. Within Ukraine, uh, so long as the operation took place far from the front lines uh, in a non-combat role. Now, that's, of course, pushing away. They had troops in Ukraine before two years ago. They've been training mostly in Poland, in the UK, and I think maybe in Latvia. I think there's three countries where Canada's training Ukrainian troops. Um, and... Uh, uh, so that's that's leaving the door open. Uh, the other another story said um, that uh, uh, all allied states. So now we know that there are actually Canadian troops and probably French troops and other troops in in Ukraine, right? So this this claim of like sending troops is not exactly. It's probably what it's really referring to is being you know sending a larger number of troops and being a bit more open about it, uh, because as uh, I think this was in the New York Times. A uh, Ukrainian official was quoted saying, all allied states are present in Ukraine. We are not talking about combat units, but for example, there are representatives 
of each intelligence service. Uh, so yeah, almost certainly there's there's CSIS, Canadian, uh, probably some JTF. We, there were reports of JTF too. There's probably still some JTF too there, special forces, and probably also I would guess uh, some uh, Canadian uh, uh, intelligence, military intelligence uh, on the ground. Um, now, of course, you know, having Canadians in a non-combat role, the issue here, what, what, what is playing off of that is that like, okay, you know, you, so you're in the west of the country, Lviv, wherever, west of the country, training Ukrainian forces, but of course, you know, Russia's hit uh, military sites in western Ukraine. And so, you know, you can have a situation where, you know, Canada's training Ukrainian forces, Russia, you know, blows up a base and, you know, Canadian, other NATO troops are killed. And that then becomes, okay, well, you've now hit NATO and therefore we, right? Like this is, it's, it's dangerous because it, it, it straddles these lines of, 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 of escalation. Uh, not that the actual training, I don't know that matters that much if the training is in Lviv or, you know, a couple hundred kilometers to the West in, in Poland. I don't, I don't, that's a little bit, uh, but it sort of plays on the whole NATO involvement uh, uh, escalation spiral. Um, I, I assume people also saw this this uh, this uh, leaked conversation that R, RT is really making a big thing of, and apparently it's a big issue in Germany where three or four uh, German generals are caught, uh, pro presumably the Russian intelligence uh, tapes them talking about these missiles that Ru that Germany that is a push for Germany to send to Ukraine. And and but they're specifically talking about blowing up um, bridge, I believe, in Crimea. And this is quite an embarrassment for the Germans. Um, it speaks to how the German military is sort of in a escalatory kind of uh, mindset with uh, with uh, Ukraine and their involvement. Um, so on uh, Thursday in Ottawa, uh, it was the 20th anniversary of the coup of uh, 2004 in Haiti. There was about 15 of us, a very, very cold on Parliament Hill, about 15 of us, maybe it was 20, 15 to 20, uh, that showed up at uh, Parliament Hill for a rally. Um, and then there was a nighttime event, a bit bigger crowd, 35, maybe uh, 40 for an indoor event uh, to, to mark the 20th anniversary of this horrible day and this serious crime of Canadian foreign policy. Um, as I mentioned uh, previously, Canada is pushing for a uh, UN, um, um, a mission led by uh, Kenya to Haiti. Uh, Ariel Henry was in uh, Nairobi, um, pushing, signing the security agreement that allows for Kenya to send the police to lead this mission to Haiti. Now, uh, last Sunday, I didn't see this, I think until Tuesday, there was a big protest at the Canadian embassy in uh, Port-au-Prince, they burned some tires uh, over Canada funding the Kenya mission, the putting up $80 million for the Kenya mission to, uh, to Haiti. Now, on the ground in Haiti, it looks like in the last 48 hours, there's a bunch of developments. Uh, some of the gangs, they shot up the airport, the Toussaint Louverture airport, and then they, uh, they was a big prison break. They, I think they attacked the prison, they attacked some police stations. And um, so there's a, seemed to quite, quite a number of people have died and there's a real ramping up of insecurity. I, you know, I don't really know what's going on. I know a lot of people that, that uh, you know, people critical of Canada's role in Haiti, they think they see this as they, they kind of like the, 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 the Western powers, obviously led by the US, they sort of activate these gangs and they create a sort of insecurity hype uh, whenever they're trying to like push a UN mission or justify a, a, uh, the foreign intervention. Um, I don't know if that's what's going on. I think that's a, certainly a, a very plausible uh, 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 scenario to understand what's, um, uh, what's going on. Um, but nonetheless, it's clearly not good from the perspective of most, most Haitians. Um, they're caught between a very, it's a very tough situation. Uh, so there is genuine insecurity with the gangs. I think it's generally a little bit hyped in our media. Uh, also, you also have this totally unelected uh, leader who is, is very unpopular. And you have the broad general kind of immiseration of much of the population. And then you have a foreign military occupation, which in theory could, could 
uh, improve the security uh, uh, situation and, you know, may even do that in the short term, but it would just reinforce the broader problem, maybe the, the central problem that Haiti has, which is that foreigners control, you know, have way too much influence in the country. And until Haitians are allowed to, you know, control their own affairs, it's, it's likely going to be a, uh, a spiral downwards, either between a, this sort of insecurity situation we have now, or something more akin to, you know, uh, the Duvalier dictatorship, where you have a highly repressed population that, um, you know, maybe there's more uh, sweatshop jobs uh, paying $5 a day. Uh, but that's kind of the, that's the sort of options, uh, so long as the foreigners control the country. And uh, of course, the alternative options of, of investing in the people and, and, um, and investing in, in a local economy and all that kind of stuff is, is more or less going to be off the agenda until uh, Haitians are, can break free from, uh, from the foreign uh, uh, domination. So Brian Mulroney, Prime Minister from 1984 to 1993, he died a couple of days ago. Um, some of the media, you know, watching the stuff on Mulroney is, uh, you know, the, it, 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 there's basically nothing from what I could tell. I mostly tried to avoid reading too much of it because there's only, you know, there's like eight pages or 10 pages of the Globe with the National Post devoted to Brian Mulroney. Uh, it just gets to be a little bit much. Um, but uh, but uh, most of what I saw on the uh, foreign policy front, there was um, a number of stories uh, was the South Africa and, and, and he led the fight against apartheid uh, South Africa, as uh, my friend uh, Samir Zuberi, who I was on the Concordia Student Union with, who is now a liberal MP, uh, he says that uh, in his tweet, it was, uh, Moroni was an early advocate, advocate against apartheid in South Africa. And then you, you have to always ask the question, they say the early advocate or they led the fight, you say, well, compared to who? He was an early advocate compared to people in Ghana? He was an early advocate who led the fight compared to people in India. He compared to people in Cuba, compared to people in Congo. What, like, who are we talking about? You know, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, the, even the Soviet bloc. I mean, the Soviet bloc, he was an early advocate compared to the Soviet bloc, the, the you know, largely white uh, Eastern European countries. So whenever they say that, you got to ask that question. And it is uh, obviously, if you start asking the question, the, it becomes kind of comical to claim that he, was, he led the fight. Uh, but um, that's how it was presented by the vast majority of Canada's media. The Globe had this piece, Jeffrey York, uh, which is, like, I kind of get the more like educated end of the, uh, of the spectrum. And he sort of, he gives all the propaganda, all the story, you know, Moroni led the fight, da, 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 da. And then he, last two paragraphs is like, okay, well, we're gonna actually like, you know, talk about this seriously. And he quotes, uh, uh, not Lin, is it Linda Freeman? Uh, anyways, the author of the book, The Ambiguous Champion, uh, South Africa, during the Trudeau and Mulroney years. I think that's the title, so not quite that, but the, basically it's a 600 page book about Canada's relationship to the apartheid South Africa from, uh, from the, mostly through the seventies and eighties. And, um, and she point, she shows uh, very obviously, very clearly that like, so basically what, what it comes down to is Mulroney was better than Thatcher and Reagan, right? That's, he, he can, he can, you, you're on solid territory that he was better than Israel, the US, and Britain. So that's solid, but it's basically saying he's the best of a bad lot. And the sanctions, you know, if you look back, right, like these Commonwealth countries were pushing to exclude South Africa way back in 1961. That's actually why uh, the Canadian government, uh, the Diefenbaker government agreed to it is because they were they were saying we're going to we're we're walking away from the Commonwealth if, if apartheid South Africa is allowed to continue in. Um, so yeah, he brought in sanctions. They were always partial sanctions. It basically cut trade in half. From eighty six to ninety three was half of the previous uh, uh, pre sanctions period. 
and um and so uh but that's blown up into like he led the fight like uh, uh kind of business and um it's not based in fact uh but it's it's really really everyone everyone right like like you know Jagmeet Singh uh, uh, Olivia Chow everyone 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 uh, uh, all the lefty kind of officialdom they all went on about about Mulroney being you know leader in South Africa and uh, and, and I, I, another part to it so so I'd say it's like it's a racist formulation because it's basically cutting out like anyone who thinks about like you would tend to think that Ghana or you know like that they were a little bit a little bit more opposed to white supremacist rule in South Africa than Canada was. I mean, it you know sort of goes without saying. And 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 so anyone, so basically it's it's racist in that it excludes the, you know the, the predominantly non-white countries and their opposition to apartheid. But it, it's also very anti-activist, right? Because because there were activist groups for decades campaigning on this issue in Canada. And so and so when Mulroney moves in 86, it's after like years and years and years of people standing outside of the the lcbo uh in in ontario saying don't buy south african wines and you know and this and that this was going on for years and years of activism um so it it it, 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 it excludes that or it it, it um, erases that uh and and then it's obviously also very nationalistic in that it's it's about reinforcing this 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 mythology of uh benevolent uh, uh canada uh, I saw one person, a uh, person in the Haitian community, um, who's got the column or used to, I don't know if she still does, but she's a fairly prominent commentator, a column in the Montreal Gazette and on La Presse. And she po her post about Mulroney was that uh, Mulroney uh, said no to Jean-Claude Duvalier when, um, uh, when the people uh, uh, drove Duvalier out in 1986. And uh, that was the end, of course, of the 30-year dictatorship, uh, François uh, Papadoc and uh, Jean-Claude Bébédoc uh, Duvalier. And um, she says that basically Jean-Claude wanted to come to Canada and Mulroney said no. And I responded to her saying, well, okay, that's, you know, good that he said no. But as a general rule, dictators fleeing, they don't, they don't go to, they don't ask countries that are like their enemies. So it's sort of a backdoor admission that Canada was, that Jean-Claude viewed Canada as a ally or, you know, a, a supporter, which of course is correct. And, and Moroni, two years during the end of the uh, Jean-Claude dictatorship, he continued that pro Duvalier position. And if you look at uh, the, 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 the late, late 80s position, uh he really pushed Canada very strongly pushed the point what you know refer, referred to as a uh, duvalierism without duvalier and the bid of the basically the military to maintain complete control of the country block elections Canada provided lots of aid uh for that process in Haiti now when Aristide is ousted in 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 um in 91 uh after the first uh free election in in Haitian history where he wins by you know 67%, the next candidate, I think is Bazin gets, I think 17%. So he's like five times what Bazin gets. And the military nine months in, eight months in, and they come and oust them. Horrible, horrible, you know, incredible amount of killing Im Im immediately. Now, uh, it is viewed that, that, that uh, um, Mulroney's government is, is more sympathetic to Aristide than George uh bush in the states and um now so i think that is correct and, I, and I, there, there was a sort of certain degree of 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 um positiveness towards canada within the haitian community on that issue back in the early 90s um but i think that's exaggerated right if you actually delve into the specifics like i i, I doing in this book on the history of canada and haiti you know canadian officials while they while they say that he's a legitimate president, they they go into the whole demonization thing and the whole business of the of the uh, of the um, necklacing, right? There's this whole claim that Aristide supporters. This is how they used to justify ousting Aristide that they're necklacing, that they're putting the tire on people and then you know burning them burning them alive. It's like you know a form of popular uh, justice, which is very brutal. Uh, obviously, 
it happened in Haiti. It's, I think, complicated, but nonetheless, it never came even close to justifying ousting Aristide and his, his involvement in it was always, they tried to blame it on him, whether he, he was involved in any way is that's very, very debatable, but, but you know, the killing that the military did, thousands of people killed, you know, far outweighed anything there. But if you look at the record, the Canadian officials really hyped that up. So they they legitimated Aristide on one level, but then they would they would do this game of undermining Aristide's legitimacy. But more, more importantly, they put pressure on Aristide to agree to these like basically the sellout to the to the U.S. to get returned to return to the end of military dictatorship to get returned to the country. So you know it's presented as he was pro Aristide. But if you actually delve into it, it's, it's, it's a bit more um, murky than, than, uh, than that. Now, what we do know very clearly, he supported the US invasion of Panama in 98, uh, uh, or sorry, I think uh, 89. Uh, he supported the airstrikes, US airstrikes in Libya in 86. He pushed quite aggressively and funded a fair bit the uh, privatization in Russia. Uh, was quite, he was quite vocal and boasted about it actually in his, in his memoir. Uh, Mulroney pushed very aggressively the structural adjustment policies. Canada put hundreds of millions of dollars by the IMF and um, and through CETA into pushing structural adjustment policies across Africa, which had all kinds of damaging uh, effects uh, across the uh, uh, continent. Um, he was very pro-Israel, uh, as I, he put it in 1988 at a while Prime Minister speaking to the Israel Bonds dinner. I am the heir of the rich spiritual and cultural legacy of Israel, which is the core of Western civilization. I have, I have admired modern Israel in the, in the way one admires a miracle. That's what Mulroney said in 88. Uh, they failed to recognize the PLO, Palestinian Self-Determination, uh, one Francophonie summit in 87. Canada was the only one of 41 countries that refused to endorse resolution of that. Uh, into the early 90s, they refused to have relations with the PLO, even after the Americans uh, uh, started relations. And the PLO official said Canada was the only country in the world refusing to have relations with the PLO at that, at that point. And probably the biggest uh, uh, thing on the foreign policy record of uh, Brian Moroni is that, he, of course, he uh, was quite hawkish on the early 90s uh, war uh, in Iraq, Canada sent I think four to five thousand troops uh, to the Middle East. He he was happy to avoid uh, to not have a a UN resolution to to figure out uh, an out to the uh, Iraqi invasion of of, of Kuwait. Uh, then when they did start bombing, they completely blew through the UN resolution, which was about protecting Kuwait, and they said you know, bombed all over Iraq. And Canadian fighter jets uh, were involved in bombing. Uh, a few, only one of a small number of countries, US, UK, uh, I think one or two others maybe that were involved in bombing. You know, they destroyed Iraqi infrastructure, killed, uh, blew up all the Iraqi uh, boats and a huge amount of infrastructure, killed, I don't know what the number is, 20,000, I believe, Iraqi troops, thousands of Iraqi civilians. Um, uh, so he was a big, he was big in the uh, first Iraq war. Um, and all this is just kind of like mostly just eliminated from the, the record. You see some people, so some people on the left, even who, who kind of went along with the, with the, uh, uh, like radical left here, went along with the, um, the South Africa kind of angle and they, they, um, they just kind of criticize his Oka, him and his stuff on indigenous and Oka, Oka, um, uh, which is again gets this this whole question of of how foreign policy is the area that's just mythologized. There's just very little of any kind of institutional pushback on the on the you know dominant media and their uh, mythologizing of all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> so. A number of developments of Palestine, and I think I'll probably just try to run through quickly. Um, there's some, I think, some big successes. This is a week of, 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 of mostly positive development. I mean, not the horrors we're seeing, of course, uh, in Gaza, um, 
uh, with the you know, flower massacre and then the follow up um, to that. But there were some um, on the activist front here, uh, some positive uh, uh, developments. Uh, Trudeau was uh, had to cancel his event at the um, in Toronto with uh, uh, with Maloney, the Italian uh, prime minister. Because uh, of Palestine Solidarity protests, they, 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 the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario, they were able to uh, block most of the entrances. I, I think that the it's kind of interesting that the PMO decided not to push it. Uh, they obviously could have got him inside, but they were, I guess, scared that it would have taken some some serious beating by the, the police would have had to really, um, and it could have looked, looked pretty ugly. Uh, so they decided to just cancel it, um, which is interesting. Uh, some of what came out of that was pretty, uh, pretty astounding. The, the, uh, uh, the uh, Marco Mancino, the ultra Zionist, uh, I guess, of Italian uh, background, uh, um, liberal MP in Toronto, he, he got, uh, there's some good video of him being um, heckled as he's walking away. And uh, he posted on Twitter, uh, quote, disgusting anti-Semitic protesters swarmed, threatened, and assaulted members of the Italian-Canadian community at an official event last night at the AGO in downtown Toronto. So now the, 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 the uh, targeting Italian-Canadian, uh, Italian mostly politicians, of course, um, uh, is, is, uh, is anti-Semitic, according to Mendicino. Um, so uh, that uh, uh, happened. Um, the the uh, special envoy uh, supposedly to combat anti-Semitism, Deborah Lyons, she came out with a statement about the protest at the um, uh, that that led to Trudeau canceling. Now, I, there, there probably were some Jewish people at at you know that went to the event, and there may have been, I don't know, maybe have been some Jewish MPs. I don't think so, but I didn't see any um, named. But she she jumped in and and basically said this was a big uh, anti-Semitic incident. So so blocking uh, an event with the heir to Mussolini, uh, Maloney, uh, prime minister um, over Palestine, and you know focusing on Trudeau and, and they, they very uh, uh, Ahmed Hussein, the international development minister, he got really really seriously heckled. Very good image, a walk of shame for him. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but that she jumps in and basically says that they need to clamp down. They need to like shut this stuff down. This protest is a big, I guess, big anti-Semitic incident. I, again, I don't, I didn't see any name of like claim of any, like, you know, Jewish prominent Jewish officials or Jewish MPs there. There may have been, I don't know. Um, uh, so she jumps in and, you know, this is, she's become, especially envoy position. it's a scandal. I mean, this is a scandal. Millions of dollars of public money is going to pay for this. And she is basically, she is just absolutely just an, an envoy to promote genocide. But she's also an envoy to promote, promote authoritarianism. Her like mantra, multiple, multiple statements is just, you know, suppress demonstrations, uh, undercut democratic rights. That's, that's like her, her kind of mantra now. It's probably like the main thing she does on, on, on Twitter um, it's a total scandal and no one, no one's calling for her, that position to be abolished, you know, independent Jewish voices, uh, not on her name, case for justice, a piece of the Middle East, find me an example, uh, find me even an example of an MP that's even criticized that position. It's like almost four years, three and a half years that positions existed as just a tool to enable apartheid and now genocide. And, 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 you know, it's public and finance, it's, you know, it's official government position and there's no criticism, no one, no one, I mean, you know, there's been, you know, little bits here and there, but no official, as far as I know, no MP has ever been willing to say, Deborah Lyons or the previous Erwin Kotler, you're wrong, any MP willing to say that. Uh, and there's no, there's no group saying, like, just abolish this thing. Why does this exist? Um, and, uh, uh, so that's that's kind of uh, interesting. I think that the symbolism of her coming out on an event with the neo-fascist, you know, the heir to Mussolini, to Mussolini, uh, uh, a political party, uh, Maloney, and her her coming out and saying this was an anti-Semitic incident, 
And uh, as far as I know, like no, no Jewish people were there uh, is, is I think quite um, uh, indicative of where things are, have all uh, uh, gone. Uh, and then the final thing to just talk about is this thing that happened yesterday in uh, Toronto, where this, this, um, this real estate uh, company uh, basically had this big Israel real estate uh, fair sell-off. Not, it's not clear exactly exactly what what was going on, but they were offering you know buy this property in Israel, this and that. Of course, they had uh, one individual uh, uh, found uh, the West Bank settlement. They were selling property in West Bank settlement of Modalin, built on a handful of Palestinian villages. A fairly recent, um, I think, set up in two thousand eight, a new a new Israeli uh, illegal colony, and. Um, so, so this got initially was going to be on some city owned, I think in Thornhill, a property, and then they canceled it and they got, then it, it, it got, went to a synagogue in, uh, in Thornhill. And there was a pretty good protest of it. Uh, and of course, it was also the, the Zionists showed up and they had their JDL types and, and um, some dude, uh, I don't got his name here. He got, he's, he has been arrested now. He's caught on video. He shot um with a nail gun two nails into a protester and apparently the guy was didn't get hurt you can see it went to his jacket and but he didn't get hurt because he had a he had like a, a a phone battery in his pocket and they hit they hit the phone battery and um <clears throat> he was quite he said he was quite scared because he thought it was an actual gun initially and uh, and so you have this video of the guy you don't see the shooting uh but you see this guy later on and he's threatening people with his with this nail gun and then he knocks the phone out of a guy's uh, hand, and then he pushes this older woman, and then he, and he puts his gun, the gun down, back in his car, and he goes into his big fight mode with this this older woman. Uh, it's all like the guy's clearly just total crazy Zionist. Um, and so that's a he got arrested um, after a big outroar on, online. And then there's this other scene caught on camera as well of these pro-Israel uh, in a vehicle who basically, I mean, he just, he drives like rams his car right at the protesters. And like, it's literally, it's an inch or two that he, that he, that he misses them. They sort of step back. Uh, I mean, this, this is, you know, if they, if he hits them, you know, seriously injured is likely and, you know, dead as possible. Um, seriously violent act. They got the, they got the, um, the, the, um, the uh license plate i haven't heard that he's the guys or, or woman i don't know uh, uh you can't see uh, from the video um that they've been uh, arrested but um but uh but yeah so so serious example the other thing that happens in this is there's a guy a palace arab looking guy who registers for the the event and he tries to go in and he gets told that he can't go he has a hat that says something about i think he says something about palace on his hat but the guy he gets told he can't he can't go into the event he can't go into the can't park his car on the, on the synagogue's lot uh, and because he's not Jewish the person says you're not Jewish can't come in which of course is totally illegal you can't discriminate against people on the basis of religion or or, or, or race but the person does it the cops there the cops don't do anything about it and then the person says uh, if, I think he says I'm not a hundred percent sure you know the audio is not totally clear but I think he says. But you couldn't you couldn't buy the property anyways, i.e., non-Jews can't a whole you know Israel has very racist laws, land ownership laws. So the guy's probably actually right that if, if you didn't want to, you did get inside and you you know you, you tried to buy the property, you're not even allowed uh, as a non-Jew. Um, that of course is you know been illegal in Canada for about seventy years. Um, <clears throat> so so it's just a, this incident in, in Toronto yesterday is a, a symbol of like how racist, openly supremacist. The Zionist movement is and how violent they are. Um, so I think I'll probably just leave it at that. I've gone on for too long one more time. And uh, if anyone have questions and comments, and I'll see if I can make uh, Laura a, um, a co-host. I don't see any. Go ahead, uh, uh, Jake. Laura, I think I've made you co-host. Okay. I just to say that I was in that demo that you said that they're selling land 
in uh, West Bank and so on to Jews here now. And it's also in the States. They started it in the States and they're going to be big demos against it and so on. Uh, I also to maybe you want to remind the people of Toronto that you have a talk presentation coming up in OISE and a book launch. Maybe you want to tell them when and where. Yeah, so I am doing uh, launches in uh, Ottawa on the 22nd. I don't have the location for that. Uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, confirmed. I actually think it is, but I don't have it. Um, Oise on the 26th, uh, Waterloo on the 27th, and then uh, Hamilton on the 28th. And I will send out a, um, and that's for the new book, uh, co-authored book, Owen Shock, uh, Canada's Long Fight Against Democracy. If anybody happened to know anybody who wanted, you know, during those days, maybe in daytime, afternoon, whatever, uh, anybody else wanted to organize something on Canada, Palestine, Canada, Israel, or, you know, whatever, I, I'd be game for that. Um, just, just get in touch with me. But yes, so Ottawa, 22nd, uh, Toronto, the 26th, Oise, uh, I'm not sure what the room is. I think it's the second floor um, at seven o'clock. Um, uh, Waterloo, 27th, uh, Hamilton, uh, 28th. Good, Larry. Uh, I'm sorry, just to say, Oise is <clears throat> room 2-214, two room 214, 7 o'clock on the 26th at Oise. Thanks, Jake. Okay, go ahead, Larry. Larry, okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and another thing about uh, Brian Mulroney, actually, he tried to recriminalize abortion, too. Uh, there was an article uh, from uh, Judy Rebick uh, from Rabble, and uh, I had forgotten about that. Um, you know, how, how absolutely horrible he actually was. <laughs> I know, like, people have been trying to, like, make him almost into a saint in the media, but he did some... Uh, he did some, uh, and he, he did some other crooked things too, uh, like the Airbus scandal and stuff too. Um, yeah, I don't know if people uh, were aware of that, but I thought I would mention that. Yeah, yeah, it was, it's amazing to see all the like you know NDP types and whatever all like celebrating uh, Moroni. Okay, B Sandu. Yeah, hi Eve. A quick question: um, If you follow Ukraine. Um, you know, on the ground, which I've been following quite closely, I mean, after the uh, Avidka uh, township that Russia took over a few weeks ago, on the northeastern part of it, I mean, they're pretty much, uh, you know, on the march, right? Uh, and I suspect with a lot of the kind of with the French and the mixed messages that, well, the Brits are already there, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Meanwhile, you have Zelensky in uh Saudi Arabia trying to talk about his 10-point 10, 10, uh, plan and so forth. Uh, I, I'm wondering what do you think about this idea? It's, it sounds conspiratorial, but it seems it's like basically a setup because, uh, oh, on Moldova, you know, on the, on the, on the other side too, the, um, I forget the name of that, that breakaway republic, which wants to join, uh, near Odessa, wants to join up with Russia. Uh, yeah. I, I think these are kinds of basically just you know, last gas to sort of, they usually show up, it was done in Vietnam, it was done everywhere. You show up a lot of sort of machismo uh, when you know that, okay, it's like, the, you know, the days are numbered. Um, I'm kind of getting that feeling that, but what do you think? Because uh, if you follow on a kind of a, you know, daily march with Russia uh, throughout the winter, it's been actually, they're the ones who have been uh, gobbling up land and, and doing quite well in terms of the actual battle. Um, so what do you think? You think this is a kind of a bit of maybe uh, something to that? Or do you think I'm just yeah, kind of... I, that is, I do think that is what's going on. I mean, I think that the, 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 the medium-term trajectory is totally in Russia's favor. And I mean, now basically everyone agrees. I mean, the established media basically agrees with that. Uh, uh, so, um, and... and I, it seems like that it's not even just medium term it's short medium and mm -hmm. longer term right so so um they 
but I do also think that there is a faction of the NATO uh, leadership that is kind of crazy enough to like, okay, let's just, we can't, we don't want to, we're not going to, we're not going to back off here. We're going to try to ramp things up. Um, uh, probably not. I don't think, I don't think, I think that that's probably not the dominant uh, that Biden ultimately is going to say, no, okay, you know, like that's not, they don't actually want to, to seriously risk nuclear kind of confrontation. But, um, but yeah, I, so I, there's no, I, I think it's clear that Russia's, Russia is, is, is winning. Russia is, uh, there, there is no plausible short to medium term scenario where Ukraine, um, gets back most of what it's lost. That's just not, that's just not a, a plausible scenario at this point. And um, uh, so, I mean, I think it's all terrible, right? I don't like, I, I, this is, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want Russia to win. <laughs> I don't want, like, I think this is, this, but this is, this is, uh, this is where it's going. Um, the best thing to me seems to be to come to some sort of agreement that the best realistic case is that is that there's you know back to some neutrality at this point i don't i don't i mean i i think the max i think the the russia you know it, it makes sense to me that the the russian maximalist position here is to go all the way to transnistria to basically cut ukraine off from uh, uh, the Black Sea, and and you know you have a, a rump state, and it's I mean I think that, that that whether Russia can pull that off, and there's you know different dynamics within that I, you know I don't know but like but that to me that to me um, you know is a is a plausible maximalist uh, Russian position and now now that would be catastrophic. For Ukraine, kind of uh, long term, um, but so, anyways, the best case scenario, I think, in there is, is some sort of neutrality, and you know, fifteen percent of the country is 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 Russia keeps fifteen percent of the country. That that's the sort of keeps most of what it's got, and maybe you know, so that I, I that's kind of um, uh, I don't think that Moscow wants to occupy Kyiv. I don't think it, it, you know, it probably wants the government to fall. I think that, that makes sense. Um, but, uh, you know, um, the, the, I, I do think that the, the sort of, uh, the faction of the NATO world, that's like, you know, they've committed a fair bit here, right? They have put, they, they, you know, they can legitimately say we've put like, our credibility online. Like I, I think ultimately they can kind of just walk away and whatever. I don't like you know the U.S. empire is not going to end or anything like that because because of, of of Russia taking twenty five percent of Ukraine. I don't like you know even if kind of the they took all the way to Odessa and whatever. But 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 um, they they you can legitimately make the argument that there is credibility online and a lot all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's just where that's where Ukraine is. It's there is no good option. This is just just all bad. Yeah. Okay, Eve. So just to let you know, we've got five hands up. So we'll go through them all. Okay, Nadia, you're up. Yes. Hi, um, Eve. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I just want. I'm so depressed. I don't know how do you manage with bad news every day, every day, every day. And if you are a sensitive person. You can see people dying right in front of your eyes and not be, you know, uh, affected. And every day, I mean, did, did I mean, you must have seen the CEO of um, Kellogg's having the gall to tell people, oh, you're too poor to eat a proper supper? Well, eat um, uh, uh, cereals, you know, eat, eat Kellogg's cereals, which, which are full of... Uh, sugar and have no nutritional value. I mean, the goal of actually seeing something like that is exasperating. I don't know, how do you cope with this? 
Well, I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, you have to, to some extent, you have to uh, cut out the, um, uh, the, like the, I don't know, the sort of, call like the, the human pain side. I, you know, I, I, I see the massacres in Gaza and I, I don't, I don't, I don't really go into like watching the math, you know, like I, there you can on Twitter, especially you can get this stuff. I, I don't do it. I don't, I don't need to see uh, more than, you know, that um, it doesn't, I don't think it helps. I'm not, I'm not in any better position to, uh, to challenge Canada's complicity by, you know, if you know the broad outlines. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't really, there's no clear answer to that, but, but um obviously it's a lot easier. I mean, <laughs> sitting here in Montreal, right? Like I go, I get, you know, I, I go to the library and much of what I do is go to the library and reading newspapers and whatever. I mean, it, compared to people who are in Gaza, I mean, it's just like luxury beyond, 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 right? So, um, and then compared to lots of people in the world, just even people who aren't under, you know, guns and whatever, just impoverished, whatever. So, um, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Alan. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, yes, uh, the the story on uh, Brian Mulroney and apartheid. I it was uh, must have been already at a point where uh, Brian Mulroney could see what was happening in South Africa and southern, uh, not just South Africa, but southern uh, uh, Africa, uh, because of of the uh, war in Angola, the civil war that was happening there, and um, um. Uh, Cuba, Cuban troops were invited in uh, to assist the Angolans who um, knew that they weren't strong enough. Uh, so uh, there were, according to the uh, internet, uh, the claim was that some 400 to 450,000 Cubans, along with uh, equipment, uh, went and took part and uh, uh, eventually um, there was a place called Quito Carnavale in uh, southern Angola where um, the Angolan uh, forces along with uh, the supported by the Cubans uh, surrounded 200 uh, South African uh, soldiers then there of course was a crisis and uh, it went to New York. It didn't say, uh, I'm guessing it must have been the United Nations, where uh, they got to serious negotiating. And uh, of course, uh, the Cubans negotiated for the release of all of the political prisoners, which included Nelson Mandela, uh, along with uh, uh, these uh, political pr prisoners from Namibia. And... Um, uh, of course, once uh, Nelson Mandela was released, uh, that was uh, where the beginning of the end of apartheid took place. Some uh, two and a half or 3,000 Cubans uh, died to um, assist in overthrowing uh, uh, that uh, the apartheid regime uh, and um, um, while well, liberating to a point uh, uh, the, the Southern Africa, which included uh, Angola and uh, in Namibia, anybody that visits uh, Namibia, the capital Windhoek, uh, you can go to, uh, there's um, a street, uh, Robert Mugabe Street, uh, Nelson Mandela Boulevard, as well as a feed, Fidel Castro Street. I think I think Brian Mulroney was part of that guerrilla force. No, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Alan. Thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yay for Cuba. Okay, Hans, go ahead. Okay, um, I have posted the details of this book launch in Toronto on the chat, and as we're finalizing or trying to finalize the publicity for this. I would like uh, anyone, especially Jake, uh, to email me with any other co-sponsoring organizations that would uh, participate in, in publicizing this event. So if you can find this in the chat, I got my phone number there and my email address. Let's make this a big, uh, big success. It's centrally located at OISI. Okay, if I may allow uh, one further comment, on the Ukraine-European situation. Um, 
I think what the Europeans are most worried about is Trump's re-election. And this may just be a, a factor that uh, the German Schultz is taking into consideration before he's sending that uh, German super cruise missile, which would uh, threaten the uh, the Kerch Bridge, uh, the the bridge on the the um, over the Azov Sea that that uh, is the alternate link to the Ukraine. Um, on the Mulroney thing, it's it's unfathomable how not a single voice of criticism, except Judy Rebix in the in the rabble, has been in the dominant media. When uh, here I got this heavy book on the take, Stevie Cameron. Everybody called him Lion Brian, and. Hands were in the till, the, the smoking guns were there. Glenn Keeley was a witness to that. Uh, how cabinet ministers in, in the Moroni government stretched out their hands. Where is the money if you want approval for your project? And um, so this is a scandal. How uh, everybody's closed ranks from Bob Ray on up are kissing the feet. It's, it's as if Stalin had died. Let's put it this way. I rest my case. Thank you. And just to, just to say, like, in, in, yeah. in, in, in death, uh, Brian Mulroney took a, gave another blow to Palestinians because the NDP had an opposition day at, in House of Commons, and they had announced a couple of days before that they were going to devote it all to Palestine. And the, the, you know, like a decent talking, I mean, you know, it's the NDP, whatever, right? But big picture a good discussion they were going to push um and uh they canceled the opposition day to push it doesn't go to march 18th because uh house of commons is intended for two weeks and the ndp agreed because in you know in, in mourning of brian mahoney uh we can't we can't have a sitting session of parliament and uh so that's pushed off till, till march 18th so even in uh even in death, he took another blow to uh, to Palestinians. But okay, Yuri, you're up. Uh, Eve, there's a great uh, thanks, Laura and Eve. Uh, always, you know, always great. Uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour and congratulations. I think you've surpassed a hundred and some episodes. I uh, my question I wanted to ask uh, is related to Brian Mulroney. Uh, two are sort of off topic, but one is just that. You know, what other uh, greatest hits of imperialism of Brian Mulroney do you think people should uh, should know about, which doesn't get uh, any level of scrutiny? And I also just want to mention that in terms of, like, you know, the Black community uh, in uh, Canada, Brian Mulroney basically launched, uh, you know, the, you, you, you know, uh, formally launched, you know, the drug war. It was a, quite a tough uh law and order man on black uh, Canadians, as well as going after welfare cheats, which predominantly hitted the black communities. But I also, uh, but, but also, you know, Brian Mulroney is also, uh, you know, as an environmental hero, and they keep mentioning two things that he did, something about acid rains, but but what do you think is also his, his real environmental record, which also doesn't get the same level of scrutiny uh, that, you know, that should get? The first thing I say that you know I wasn't I wasn't politically active during Brian Mulroney's time, so I'm I'm no like expert on Brian Mulroney's time. I've just gone back and looked at you know Canadian foreign policy element. I do think that the, the environmental one I find very interesting. Okay, so Elizabeth May, she's all over saying he was the greenest prime minister in Canadian history. Elizabeth May, of course, um, she I don't know what her position was, but she she was in. I don't know if she was the, she was in the environment ministry, I believe, or maybe she was even like, I don't think she was an environment minister, but she was, she had some position in the Mulroney government around environment. I don't, I don't know what it, what it was exactly, but I don't remember what it was, but, but the fact that she says that I find actually quite um, uh, fascinating because he, I guess he's known for having done the, um, uh, the, uh, 
is it the, is it the um the ccf's treaty uh no what is it uh, um anyways he's he's known for negotiating at least one yeah. Somebody, somebody, I'm sure knows what, what I'm referring to. A couple of international treaties, but what? But but like he's also known for pushing free market capitalism. So to me, like if you're saying he's the greenest prime minister, you're saying there's no connection between like capitalism and the environment. That to me, like because Elizabeth May, I believe, would accept that. Moroni was a proponent of a, let's call it a more extreme version of capitalism. I think she would accept that, that, that he was in negotiating the first free trade agreement, et cetera. So I find that like, it's like there's no connection between the environment and an economic system based upon uh, endless consumption and that, you know, class divide um, is a part of of the anti-ecological uh, uh, policies that we pursue, et cetera. I think that, that that's that's quite interesting. I don't know much about the rest of the part that you were you asked about. I don't know know much about his role in in um, kind of you know war on drugs and stuff like that. Um, but I do think that the the environmental uh, uh, side is a, is an interesting question. I'd like to see someone kind of flush out. Um, but yeah. Okay, so our final question is John. John, go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, always a delight, Eve. I'm just on the whole Russia-Ukraine thing. There's, uh, if you're in addictions, whether it's gambling or something else, one of the things that you're that you get advised if you're suffering from this is don't uh, don't chase the bet, right? But that's exactly what NATO's doing. They 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 gambled on this approach. And now they're chasing it right till the end. And and my worry is that rather than admit defeat, they'll they'll bring out the nukes. Uh, it you know that there's, I think it is a matter of faith. I don't have proof that there are mid-level uh, generals or uh, others who uh, have the potential to uh, launch tactical nuclear devices on their own authority. It scares the crap out of me. And. Uh, and I just, uh, I just hope it uh, doesn't come to that. The, uh, the fact is that uh, Ukraine, I mean, I'm reminded of the old expression we used to say back in the day, right? There is no, the only, uh, the only just war is a class war. And uh, that's not at all what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, or with NATO. It's uh, the, the working class is paying the price for various uh, middle-aged and older men's egos being at stake. So I don't know what we can do here to, curtail that because we have our own uh, idiots in the military but uh, I just want to thank you for the good work and cross our fingers that this that this isn't the one that leads to the trigger and on, on Elizabeth May she was uh, good friends of the Clintons and if you know about the role the Clintons played in the destruction of uh, Glass-Steagall and the Moderate Financial Modernization Act that's all you need to know about Elizabeth May she's uh, a vaguely green-hued uh, deeply neo neoliberal uh, uh, activist yeah yeah just to, just to say i do think there is something that we can do i think we can't on the on the nato question ukraine i think we can rekindle the anti-war movement and and i i'm i, I think i think it's going to be interesting to see hopefully israel is going to stop the worst of its killing not too long it might they may very well not they might continue on for a long time but but at some point they'll probably it will stop and i will be interested to see where peace anti-war anti-imperialist forces are at that point because we i have never seen uh a anti-imperialist internationalist mobilization like we've seen we had three thousand here this was the 23rd i believe weekend in a row uh it seems surprising but i counted they counted the dates in the map uh, on the on the, sorry, on the calendar 23rd there was the first one was october 8th 23rd uh it was 3000 people on saturday and there has been dozens there have been dozens and dozens of other uh protests in montreal and obviously across the country where is, what's going to happen to those forces again hope israel stops the killing not too long from now um you know we we may be in a much better position to build a peace, broader peace movement, 
that's to do with anti-NATO, you know, like there's going to be a, there's a lot of people who are like, ah, I don't think this whole Canada just trying to help sovereignty Ukraine, eh, that doesn't make much sense to me anymore. Um, so anyways, uh, but yes, uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Um, um, same place, uh, same time uh, uh, next week. Thanks, Steve. Yeah.